Good morning. My name is Susan Bonfield, and I'm with Environment for the Americas. And thanks for joining us for World Migratory Bird Day Live, Birds Connect Our World. If you were with us last week, thanks so much for joining us again. And if you're new to the program, well, thanks for coming, and we hope you join us in the future. So we have a busy program today. Today we're going to meet Sam the Shorebird. We're going to play a game, watch a movie, and then I have two special guests on the line. And those guests, Alicia, Alicia King from the Chugach National Forest in Alaska and Erica Galleta, a shorebird researcher, are going to help you at the end by answering your questions. And also that's going to be a big help to me because I know that those of you who were on the line last week asked me some pretty tough questions. So I'm looking forward to what they can do. I have a few instructions for you for those of you who have just joined. Uh, if you have any questions or you want to share your child's name and age in the, in the question box, please put that there. We can answer any concerns. Um, the audio seems to be working, so I'm hoping that everyone has that figured out on their end. This program is sponsored by the U.S. Forest Service, uh, Chugach National Forest, and we're hoping that we have a lot of visitors from Alaska on today. So if you are from Alaska, we'd like to know. Uh, and then again, Alicia King from the Chugach National Forest has joined us to help us with the program. There's also, I think I told you about the handout box. There are two handouts in the handout box that you can download. One is our coloring page for this week, and it's actually an activity that we'll discuss at the end of this program. The other is another activity um, that's going to help your child uh, learn about the sequence or order of events from the movie that we're going to watch. At the end of the program, we'll open it up for questions and answers. And I know from parents' comments last week, uh, I learned that maybe you want to wait to have any interactivity interactions with the computer itself. So I'll try to limit that. And that it's good to have our communication happen at one time. So thanks so much for those of you who wrote in and those of you who helped, um, helped us to improve the program this week. We're looking forward to, to making, making it better and better. So let's get started with our program. This is Sam, and Sam is what's called a shorebird. Sam is actually a western sandpiper, which is one species of shorebird, and there are many different species. Sam, one of Sam's favorite places is the Chugach National Forest in Alaska. And this is a place that Sam visits every year when he's migrating especially as he's flying north, which he's doing now, and planning to land on the coast of, the, of this forest where he'll stop to rest and feed and refuel before he continues on where he'll nest and lay it and um, where he'll nest and raise young. Sam's favorite habitat is mud flats. Look at all that mud out there. There are many reasons why Sam likes this area, but the most important one is that this is where Sam finds his food. Sam has these very special toes. And if you imagine yourself barefoot in this mud somewhere without your shoes on, think about what that would feel like. How would that feel on your toes and between your toes? Probably because we're heavier than Sam, you might squish down into the mud and feel that mud seep up between your toes. But for Sam, Sam has these long toes so that he can walk in the mud without sinking in like we might do. Sam also has a very special bill and shorebirds have amazing beaks or bills. This is like your mouth. We all have mouths and we can all eat pretty much the same things. But shorebirds have very different bills, and that helps them to eat very different things. So if you look at the longest, curviest bill on the left, you'll see that that bill can help a shorebird curve down into the mud to find animals that might live down there. Other bills are even turned up a little bit. Some bills, like Sam's, are kind of short and straight, and they help him to probe into the mud or even eat on the surface. This is Sam's body, and again, we talked about a long, thin bill to find food and water in the mud, and the long toes that help him to walk in muddy, sandy places. 
But Sam has also long legs, and that makes it so that Sam can walk in the water without getting his feathers wet. Sam also has to fly long distances, and he wants to make it as fast as he can. So he has very pointed wings that help him to fly as fast as possible. What do you think Sam eats? Now, I asked this question last week, but we had a hummingbird in the picture. This week, we have Sam. And on our picture, we have a, what's called a mollusk, which is the, the org animal with the shell on the top left. And if you peek inside that shell, you'll see something that's kind of yellow. Well, that's actually the animal, and that shell is its protection. But that animal inside, well, that's very yummy to eat for some some animals. There's a worm, there are seeds, and then there are chocolate chip cookies. So what do you think Sam would eat? Would Sam eat chocolate chip cookies? I had to put this in there because actually chocolate chip cookies are my favorites. Lily and Brooks say mussels. Another person, Katrina or Katrina's child, says worms. Nobody says seeds, and nobody says chocolate chip cookies. You're right if you said mussels or worms. That's what Sam likes to eat, and lots of other things as well. Any small animals that Sam can find in the mud or even on the surface of the water. This is an amazing image of Sam pulling a worm out of the mud, and you can see that this is not an easy job. So Sam has to grab this worm and pull it out. By the time that Sam was done, he was standing on his tiptoes, pulling that worm out before eating it. When people go out and look at birds, they have to know the names for the part of a bird. Just like you need to know the names for the part of your body. A lot of these names are the same and some are different. So let's learn the names of some of the body parts of birds. I want you to look at the picture and you have to find the bird that has the body part I'm talking about. So in the picture, can you look and find the bird that features an arrow to the top of the head or the crown? The crown is what we call a bird's, not the whole head, but the top of the head. Like if you pat yourself on a head or if you were gonna wear a crown, this is what's called the crown. Can you find the bird that shows a bird's nares or nostrils. A bird's nostrils are located on its beak. Can you find the bird with an arrow pointing to its beak or bill? And can you find the bird with an arrow pointing to its wing, kind of like our arms? Now a bird's belly is actually almost between its legs. Our belly, of course, you can pat your belly, is not between our legs, but a bird's kind of is far down there. So see if you can find the arrow that is near Sam's legs. And how about the back of a bird? Well, that's similar to where our back is. It's on our back. Can you touch your chin? And then find an arrow to a bird's chin. It's right below the beak. And how about the throat? The throat is just below the chin. So find the arrow that points to a bird's throat. And then how about the breast? Find a bird that shows an arrow pointing to its breast. And let me know if you had any trouble. I'm getting lots of answers. Top left, middle left, bottom right. So good job for all of you who are able to find the birds with all those body parts. Now, before we get started with Sam's story, we're gonna play a game called Simon Says. I don't know how many of you have played Simon Says, but it's a fun game. Now, if you look at what these kids are doing, they're all touching their noses. The little girl in the front, well, she's touching it pretty hard. I won't ask you to do anything like that. But this game, Simon Says, asks you to touch different things in our game today. So Simon Says, touch your nose you're going to touch your nose. But if Simon doesn't say it, you don't wanna do it. So let's practice this. Simon says, 
touch your nose. Everybody should be touching their nose. Now, let me do it again. Okay, everybody, touch your nose. Should you touch your nose? No, because if you touched your nose when I said touch your nose without saying Simon Says, that means you're out of the game. Okay, everybody understand? If Simon says do it, do it. And if Simon doesn't say it, don't do it. So I'm imagining you all out there. I want you to all stand up and pretend that you're Sam the Shorebird. And I'm going to do Simon Says with all of the body parts. And just as a reminder, I'm going to go back to the body part page. All right. Simon Says, touch your wing. Simon Says, touch your back. Simon says, pat your belly. Touch your crown. How many of you touched your crown? Raise your hand. Nobody. I don't see any hands going up. You're too smart. All right. Simon says, touch your rump. Oh, I think I didn't tell you where that one is but I think you can figure it out. Simon says, touch your chin. Simon says, touch your nares. Simon says, touch your crown. Touch your chin. How many of you touched your chin? Oh, I see somebody. The Cody Jen family touched the chin. All right, good job, you guys. I hope that you learned the parts of a bird's body. Those are just some of the names, and that's something that you can use when you're outside looking at birds and you wanna describe it. So let's talk about Sam. Sam flies quite a long distance, twice every year. Ah, oh, I've just flown a long way, all the way from down in South America, up to Alaska, where he'll stop and rest and feed and then nest. Sometimes it was a really scary trip. I'm here. Can you find me? Look very closely. Sam is in this picture. But he's confused because of all the lights and all the buildings. Tell me if you can find Sam in this picture. I'm going to leave it up for just a minute because Sam is kind of hard to find. All right, Halen has found Sam. And the Moscoso family has found Sam. So good job. If you can't find Sam at the end of the program, I'll go back to this and I'll help you find him. Migrating makes me so hungry. Yikes, that dog is fast. When Sam finally makes it to Alaska, he says, I didn't even have to use the runway. And there are so many other birds here. I'm just in time for the Copper River Shorebird Festival in Alaska. Look at all those people looking at me. Ah, and I've found someone perfect. As Sam heads along his journey, they reach their nesting site. And Sam and Serena lay four beautiful eggs. After some days of keeping the eggs warm, the chicks begin to hatch.
and Sam and Serena live happily ever after. I want you to think about that story, which is very short, but has a lot of information in it. And tell me some of the things that you saw that Sam had to, that were challenges to Sam as he migrated up to his nesting site. What do you remember, for example, when Sam said, I am so hungry. What kind of food was there on the ground for Sam? And what kind of things weren't food? Do you remember? Ah, uh, yes. So I see the answers. A lot of litter and a lot of trash. I'm going to go back to that picture. There's a lot of litter on the ground. And sometimes animals like Sam don't know what's food and they don't know what's trash. And if they eat the trash, it can make them very sick. The Kitmer family says that the cat is dangerous. And yes, cats can be very dangerous for birds because they eat birds. How about in the scene with the buildings? What happens when birds are around a lot of bird buildings with lights? Those lights, like the Kitmer family says, those lights can help, can confuse birds. They don't know where to go. Sometimes they're even attracted to those lights and they might fly into the buildings or even into the windows. So good job. Plastics, lights, and dogs off leash. Dogs off leash that chase birds can really harm the birds. It doesn't look like they're harmed because they're just flying, but think about it. If you just ran and ran and ran and were resting and all of a sudden a dog came and chased you away, you would be exhausted. That's what happens to Sam and other birds that migrate very long distances. When they have to migrate very long distances and they're tired and they need to eat, having a dog or another animal chase them can really hurt them and even make them sick. But fortunately, many birds like Sam make it to the places where they want to go. And this is actually the airport in Alaska, near where Sam is going to go to feed on those mudflats. Where we had just finished talking about Sam and Serena, who made it to Alaska where they would nest and raise young. We've got two experts on the line, and they are here to answer your questions. So I'm gonna open it up to you. And this is your coloring page for the day. I don't know if any of you have already had the opportunity to do it, but we wanna know what your questions are. And we're going to unmute you if you raise your hand and have a question. So I see that the Mineo family has a question. Can you speak now? I've unmuted your line to the Mineo family. So Katrina Mineo, I've unmuted your line. Can you hear me? Okay, maybe not. I'm gonna go on and ask one of the questions then. And I've got Erica Galleta and Alicia King and myself on here. And we're going to do our best to answer your question. Can you hear me? Oh, now we can hear you. Okay. My question is, how many different types of shoreline birds are there? Oh, good question. And what is your name and how old are you? My name is Halen Minio, and I am 10. Oh, great. Erica, that's a question for you. Hmm. Hey, well. Shut up. The question was, how many different types of shorebirds there are? Is that your question? Yeah. Good. Is that the question? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So there's lots of kinds. Um, so we have uh, shorebirds in different families from sandpiper to plover. Um, there's also the tattlers. Um, 
So the exact number, uh, I don't know, Alicia, do you know the exact number? There's so many. So what a great question. And there are over 70 different kinds of shorebird species. So over 70 different kinds of, of shorebirds. And um, in Alaska, there are about 69 or 70 types of shorebirds that fly through or live in Alaska. And 37 different species of shorebirds that actually make their home to raise their families in Alaska. And I read somewhere, I told you, I warned you that these guys ask really tough questions. Mm -hmm. I've looked it up quickly, and it says about 379 species. Thank you to Google search. All right. Thank you, Halen. We'll give someone a chance. Anybody else have a question and would like to raise their hand and do it live? Or I can read it from the question box. All right. We have a question from... Uh, the Williams family, it says Dasty Williams. I don't know if that's a parent or a child, but you can enter, if you could say your name and your age. Dasty, can you speak now? Maybe not quite yet. I don't see the unmute. There we go. Okay, you should be able to talk. Okay, my name is Levi and I am eight and um, I live in California with my sister, and um, we really like this picture right here because it shows like the Piper movie because we have it like on Disney Plus and it's so cool. You're right. And also, it's the best. They, my question is, my question is, do they eat sand crabs? Erica, do you know if Sam the shorebird, the western sandpiper, eats sand crabs? It might be a little tough for them to eat, um, but they can. Um, but they mostly prefer crustaceans of other sorts, like the uh, little insects, uh, worms, and uh, mollusks, like in the movie. Thank you for answering my question. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, next question. Would anybody else like to raise their hand or would you like, oh, I have a question uh, coming from the Lee family. So I will unmute the Lee family. Okay, you're ready. To the Lee family. I think you can talk now. While we wait for the Lee family, so I have Naya Lee, who should be able to speak now. I'm going to ask another question. Somebody asked the question, oh, the Moscoso family asked, don't Sam's feet get cold? So birds have a special mm -hmm. adaptation and their uh, their blood from in their feet this is um the same for other animals that are could be in cold water like ducks they actually have blood that runs down to their feet and then the return blood that comes back up and the arteries and the veins run very close together so that the warm blood that's coming from the heart helps to keep the feet warm even as the blood cools as it's coming back up um, to be pumped by the heart again. This is called counter current circulation. And so that's what helps keep the bird's feet warm is that the, the blood vessels are close together so that they stay warm. Okay, I don't see that the Lee family was able to speak. So I'm gonna choose another hand. Uh, let's try the Betts family. And I have Justin Betts. Justin, can you speak? Yes. Great. You want to tell us your name and your age? My name is Justin, and my age is eight. 
great. What's your question? How do shorebirds get confused from lights? Alicia, you want to go for that one? Sure, Justin, that's a great question because as you know, in lots of cities, we have lots of lights. And so oftentimes the birds, when they're flying, especially at nighttime, as a lot of shorebirds and birds fly at night, the light um, reflects off of the building and that confuses them and they have a hard time seeing what is a building and where they're supposed to be going based on where the moon might be. And so they see a reflection of the light and it makes it hard for them to see where they're going. So they get confused by that. Thank you. Thanks, Alicia. All right, we have a question from Abby. Abby's question is, what is the rarest kind of shorebird? Erica, you want to take that one on? Sure. Hi. Hi, Abby. That's a great question. Um, so the rarest type of bird is, is birds that are, we're seeing that are, their population has dramatically declined. Uh, so we have a lot of threatened species. Um, so they're, they're hard to find because um, they're, there's less of them um, in their habitat. So we have species like the snowy plover, um, and then in areas uh, where it's hard to get, um, it would be hard to, to find these shorebirds, like the Eurasian uh, uh, curlew, um, and things like that. And I'm going to add to that, Erica, and say that one of the mm -hmm. most famous and rarest shorebirds is the spoon-billed. Um, sandpiper oh, yeah. and that one has the reason why it's called spoon build is it has a really funny looking bill it's actually uh kind of flattened out at the end and it looks a little bit like a spoon um, but this is one of the rarest of the birds and one that everybody is concerned might disappear and that we may no longer have in the future uh, so um, but, but there are a lot of shorebirds that um, we are concerned about. Um, they do fly a long way, and they do face a lot of challenges. So that's one of the reasons why we had this program today was to teach you about that. Thanks, Erica. Uh, do shorebirds cross a road? Now that's a good question. Alicia, I think you mm -hmm. should go for that one. <laughs> Thank you, Sue. Thank you for that question. Um, do shorebirds cross roads? Um, they fly over roads and sometimes they'll walk over roads because they're going from one place to another and birds don't necessarily recognize that it's a road. So one of the things that wasn't pictured this morning are cars. Cars can be a problem for birds if birds are crossing a road or flying across a road or trying to walk across a road. Um, they could be hit by a car. So yes, Birds do cross roads sometimes. Thanks, Alicia. I think we answered the Muscosa's other family. Do sandpipers nest on the ground? Erica. Hi, great question. They do, they're ground nesters, um, and they often make a little scrape on the ground, and they add uh, little twigs and grasses um, to to create a nest for their 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 eggs. Good, and you remember the photo that we showed earlier, and you can see it also on your coloring page um, that they do put their eggs on the ground. And some shorebirds barely build a nest; they actually just do mm -hmm. what's called a scrape, uh, which means they kind of dig away a little bit of the sand and they lay their eggs on the sand. That is, if they're you know nesting on a beach. Uh, like the snowy plover, uh, so that that also can make them very difficult to find. Good question. Um, let me see if there are any other hands up. I see that the Orsburn family has a hand up. I see Tyler Orsburn. So Tyler, I have unmuted you if you'd like to ask a question. Let 
we should be able to do that. There we go. Sorry, the hand was up accidentally. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, let me see what other questions we have in our chat box. Uh, Brooke, age five, wants to know if other birds are dangerous to shorebirds. Erica, do you have some thoughts on that? Um, I think in the video we saw, or the presentation, we saw peregrine falcons. And so there's other birds, like um, there's burgeonous, or not the burgeonous hawk, but there's other types of hawks that also prey on, on birds. Um, and then we may have birds that kind of flush birds out, so they kind of uh, may scare them and, and energy um, from the shorebirds may kind of like what the disturbance with the dogs were. So if there's a lot of predators around. Um, and then there's also crows and, and ravens that often eat the eggs. So that's a problem that, um, that, that's, um, that may disturb uh, nesting shorebirds. Yeah, good. Thanks, Erica. And that's true. A lot of raptors are birds of prey, birds that eat meat. They can definitely be a threat to shorebirds. And we have another question from the Williams family. Uh, do they travel across the world forever? Um, that's a good question. So shorebirds migrate twice a year. So right now, shorebirds are heading up to where, Alas uh, where Alicia lives. Um, that's a long journey. So it can take them some days to make it up there. But once they get up there, they're going to stay up there for some months. And like we saw, they're going to nest and lay eggs and raise young. And then sometime in late summer, they'll start the journey back down uh, to areas that aren't going to have snow-covered you know, ground during the winter, uh, and they'll travel quite far, actually, for Sam the shorebird, all the way down to South America, uh, on the coast of South America, where they'll spend the winter months. So they do this trip twice a year. Uh, once um, in, the, in the late winter, early spring, they start moving north, and then back again, uh, late summer, early fall, they start moving south. And they do that every single year. Good question. How long does it take for the eggs to hatch? Erica, do you know the incubation time for a Western sandpiper? It, let's see. I know it's about 27 uh, for, for uh, curlew, um, but for sandpipers, it takes about, um, I'm exactly sure. I would imagine around 27, 25 days. And then for the first time that they fly in, is within 17 and 21 days of them hatching from their, from the egg. Okay, good. So a little less than a month uh, is about the time mm -hmm. it takes for uh, some shorebird eggs to hatch. And of course, like Erica said, there are a lot of different types of shorebirds. And so the different species take different amounts of times. Mm -hmm. How tall are most shorebirds from the Mineo family? Well, that's a good question. How tall? They are in length. I have the length and the width. Um, so the length is around uh, five point five to six inches and then they they weigh um nine point nine two ounces oh not very much and how tall mm -hmm. did you say they are again they're around like three three four inches so quite small mm -hmm. How many sandpipers visit Alaska to breed? Alicia, do you have any ideas about how many 
western sandpipers are in Alaska because Alaska is like one of the most important places for this bird, this species. For the western sandpiper, I don't know the actual number of how many breed here. We have 30 different, uh, 37 different kinds of shorebirds that breed in Alaska. And we have seven to 12 million shorebirds that pass through or breed um, in Alaska as far as numbers go. So, uh, you're, you know, Sue, you're right. They ask really great, tough questions. And I'm going to have mm -hmm. to look that one up as to how many actually breed of Western sandpipers actually breed in Alaska. Yeah, and I know that um, at the at the um, Copper River Shorebird Festival, like thousands of Western sandpipers stop in the Copper River Delta of Alaska, which has huge mudflats where Western sandpipers can stop and feed before they fly even farther north. And the flocks are in the thousands, so even up to you know three or five thousand birds can be there in one sighting. But they also stop in other lo locations. So, um, you know, they, there might be different groups of birds in different places. We also have another shorebird specialist on the line. We have Robert Johnston on the line. So if we really need to uh, get some help here, we can also ask Robert to give us a hand. Robert, mm -hmm. if you want to answer any of these questions, you can, I can unmute you or you can put it in the chat box. Are some shorebirds endangered? Do we know um, which species of shorebirds might be endangered? I'll leave that open for Erica and Alicia. So there are there are a lot of um, quite a bit. Alicia, uh, do you know specifically how many shorebirds? I don't know how many species, maybe you could talk a little bit about the piping plover or um, some of the other species that we know are, you know, endangered or threatened. So Sue, this is Alicia. And when we talk about birds, there are different ways that we describe them, whether they're endangered um, and on the um, endangered species list, whether they're critically endangered, and so the roseate terns and piping plovers are listed as endangered. And there are other birds. Um, you mentioned the spoonbilled sandpiper. They are um, threatened birds. And so there's, there's, uh, there are a lot of different ways that we can categorize those birds. And so you mentioned the food, the specialty of certain birds like the spoonbilled. And birds like red knots, the shorebirds that are called red knots, are, um, we think of them as being endangered because of their specialty of what they eat. And when they fly their long migratory paths and they go to the beaches where they should be finding food, they might not be able to find all of the food um, that they need. And as their habitat shrink or the threats like um, dogs or cats or loss of habitat, that helps make them even more endangered or more threatened. Thanks, Alicia. That's there's really there's a number of birds that are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like you said, um, endangered is a word that a lot of people know, and birds have different uh, statuses, they're called, so different terms that are used to describe you know, how concerned we are about them with endangered and critically endangered being the, the highest level. Uh, some birds mm -hmm. are birds of concern or have special status in different states. So even your own state might have a different designation for those birds. So for example, uh, in, in the East, um, American oyster catchers are, are, have special conservation status as do um, other seabirds like black skimmers. So thanks. That's a very good, very good question. Uh, we have another question, which is, uh, why do dogs chase birds? Well, that's a that's a good one. Um, I think that you know dogs are predators, and they see an animal, and they often chase it. They chase 
birds. They chase squirrels. And not all dogs do this, but, um, you know, different dogs do it. And it might be different breeds of dogs. For example, my dog is a Labrador um, and her name is Delta. And Delta would love to chase birds. And that's why when I go somewhere where there might be birds nesting or even just birds feeding, I keep her on a leash because she would like to chase after them. I think it's an instinct for them to do that. And it's hard sometimes to teach dogs not to chase birds, especially if it's something that that type of bird does, a uh, dog does. So for example, Labradors, you know, they're retrievers. They're the kind of dogs that if you go hunting, they go out and they, they get the bird and they bring it back to you. Uh, so, so there's some of that kind of in her, in her makeup, uh, is to go, to go get a bird. Um, but that, that is hard on a bird. And like we said before, when birds have to fly away and then come back, it can affect their ability to take care of their young and to get their food. All right, I'm gonna take um, one last question because we've been on for quite a while and you guys are a great audience. So the last question is, what can we do to help them not be endangered? I'm gonna turn that over to Alicia. Thanks, Sue. There are a lot of things that we can do to help birds, and you've seen some of them, and Sue has talked about some of them. So keeping your dog on a leash, keeping your cat indoors, um, protecting your windows, so turning lights off at night, um, making sure that birds can see windows so that they don't accidentally fly into them, saving habitat for birds, making sure that we have places where birds can fly through areas, rest, get food, and then be able to fly off. Saving habitat places where birds can have their babies and raise their young, where they're not gonna be threatened. And supporting organizations and people who do conservation work. So there are a lot of different ways that you can help um, protect birds. And those are just a few of them. Thanks, Alicia. And I want to invite all of you, we're going to have another uh, session this morning, same book, same story, same topic, uh, same movie, um, starting in, oh, what time is it? Starting in about 40 minutes, and you're welcome to join again if you want to and didn't get your questions answered. But we also have on Thursday, April 1st, The Crab Eating Gull by Tizio and Tito Naraski. So we'll be talking about seabirds. And then on Thursday, April 9th, we're going to do John James Audubon, Painted Birds. This is a story about a famous artist, one of the early artists who painted birds. And the, the um, World Migratory Bird Day 2020 artist is going to be on with you to lead you through an art activity and to show you her studio. So we hope that you can join us. Um, on the Thursday, April 1st session, um, Tizio will be reading the book in Spanish during the Spanish session. And um, we'll have a Spanish se session for each of these programs. So thanks very much, all of you guys. We'll be in touch with you by email. Um, we appreciate your participation. And if you wanna send in your suggestions for future stories or topics, uh, we're happy to take them. We're enjoying this and hope you are too. So thanks very much. And we look forward to next week.